Great. Welcome to Tabula Poetica once again. We are recording today's events and we'll post the videos on our YouTube channel after the whole series concludes this semester. The fall series last event is on December 13th at 7 p.m. right here. And raise your hand if you're reading. It's the MFA poetry reading. So you all need to come back and listen to the MFA poets. This year's Tabula Poetica events are sponsored by the English Department, the Dean's Office of Wilkinson College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and also poets and writers. Enormous thanks to Julia Ainley, who handles the logistics for Tabula Poetica, and she really had my back today, as usual. Let's give a separate round of applause to Julia. Also, um, huge gratitude to Jan Osborne and Logan Estale and Genevieve Kaplan, whose students engaged with the work of all three visiting poets this semester. And Logan Estale is here, so you could give him a round of applause as well. And whenever you enjoy a literary event, either in person or watching online, I encourage you to read the author's book. Our campus bookstore, right over here, <laughs> has copies available for you today, and they have done a great job supporting all these talks and readings. This is the last one that they're staffing of this semester, so give them a round of applause, too. And then your phone, your mobile device. Make sure that it is silenced for the reading but also if you want to share your happy experience of poetry on social media, I encourage you to do that too. Bloss Falconer has been on my list of poets to bring to campus for a long time, and I'm happy that he's here tonight. He's traveled to Chapman University from San Diego State University, sort of. <laughs> Just today, and we were just talking about this before we started, just today I realized that we both earned our MFA at the University of Maryland, and we were talking just now about how that was um, the right decision for each of us, but perhaps for different reasons. His most recent book is Forgive the Body This Failure from Four Way Books, which is available for purchase this evening. <laughs> He recently wrapped up a run as poetry editor for the Los Angeles Review, and he has edited a collection of essays that addresses how U.S. Latina and Latino literature might be considered a definable whole while also acknowledging cultural variety and shifts. So he does a whole lot of work to foster and nourish literary culture. Before the pandemic began, I heard Bloss Falconer read his work at Antioch, LA, where Victoria Chang directs the low residency MFA. I mentioned Victoria in part because she's taught here and also because she said, and this is from the quote on the back of the book, reading Falconer's work is like hanging in suspension in between space, a light, always waiting hungrily for the next whisper. And that really had me thinking about whether that's how I was hearing the poems also. For me, reading Forgive the Body This Failure, I see this suspended whispering quality as inherent in the language and form of these poems, so often in couplets, so often a story of juxtaposition. The speaker and the you of Use Your Words just to give you an example, are driving and listening to the radio. Once the you says, I do love you, the poem turns to the window holding the sun, the speaker holding breath, the mountain prepared to burn. If this poem is a whisper, it's about to erupt into fire. 
Again and again, what is contained in these poems is shaped by what's edging their limits and, as a love poem suggests, by the difference between remembering and remembering to tell someone. Often the poems hold the next moment both inside them and at bay. The final lines of a simple proof capture what I'm trying to articulate here. The poem lets a stillness hold the frame of the thought in his mind. So think about the layers that, that those lines imply. We have the thought, the mind, the frame, and stillness. So there's this sort of layering of the experience in the poem. And I'll just add that, wow, these poems have a lot of heart. Please welcome Blas Falconer. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for being here. I know um, we're kind of well into the semester. Um, at that point in the semester, maybe we're tired, <laughs> a little worn down. So I really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I've had so many interesting conversations today. I've had such a great time. So I want to thank everybody who's taken care of me since I've been here and supported me and um, yeah, made me feel welcome. I'm so grateful. I also love talking about Maryland and our experiences there and how we were shaped by our teachers. Um, it's so wild to come back to this book. I wrote this, this book was published in 2018. And uh, um, you might not know this, but it take, you know, takes a long time for a book to come out. So it means I probably finished in 2016, and maybe it took me like seven years to write it. So some of these poems are pretty old. Just a little background, I, I had written two books before this one, and the second book I wrote, The Foundling Wheel, I wrote as a, a, the father of a young child. And um, it was a time of... Um, uh, where I got very little sleep and I was working full time and I was very, um, there was a lot of mixed conflicting emotions about parenthood and that book expressed a lot of that. And when I finished it, I didn't know what was next for me in terms of poetry. I didn't know, like you don't want to write the same book over again. And I thought, I might be done. I might be finished writing poetry. I don't know what's next. And my dear friend Kazem said, Kazem Ali said, come write at this writer's residency community of writers. And I was like, okay. But I didn't, I really was ready to quit my job as a professor and <clears throat> try something different. And I went there and I just quieted down. And I thought, okay, when I strip away all of the bells and whistles and I you know, just kind of with myself, um, what do I, what's there? And so this book emerged, the first poems emerged from that um, quietness. And I just wanted the poems to be as spare as I could make them. And, um, and slowly the book came about. Um, I'd like to read a few poems from this book. And then um, I'd like to read a few poems from the next book. And then... <laughs> I'd like to read a few poems from the next book. <laughs> it's like, um, th but um, the, the, the third book that I'm talking about is, I, I literally only have three poems that are worth reading. So it's like, I'm not very far into it. But I thought um, it would be nice to um, try them out. Um, so this book um, is divided in four sections. And it took me a while to figure out how to organize the poems. And I did think of them as, um, I had these kind of thematic sections, and the first one was um, about the failures of the body, um, uh, literal failures. Of a dear friend of mine passed away unexpectedly, and so I wrote a number of poems about that. I'm going to read the last poem from that section, which is the shortest, was until recently the shortest poem I'd ever written. <laughs> um, it's called Heaven. It's very short, so... Heaven, how will I get there? How will I ever know how to get there? My son asks, sobbing suddenly, months after. 
if you don't let me see them die. I had, um, we had these three animals and they all, they were seniors, and they all died very quickly. And it was in this moment where my son and I were talking one night, months later, where he just broke down and he, he just, it took him that long to process it. And I, and I realized he was so young, he literally thought that you died and then you would visually like go to heaven. And um, it was such a, a shocking moment for me and I didn't know how to capture it. And then I realized, oh, I just need to say what he said and get out of the way. So an example of quieting down and getting rid of the, the bells and whistles. Um, the second section of the book really focused on parenthood. And, um, and I'm going to read the first poem from that section. Um, um, it's called Apology for My Son Who Stops to Ask About His Mother Once More. The branch bent to the ground as if under the weight of its own white blossom is like a sadness I see growing inside you. What can I do but tell again how under the fluorescent light she bent over your swaddled body, her face pale against her dark brown hair, yours dark against the pale sheet? That is your story. This is your share of the world's grief, what you must carry and which I cannot bear for you. Um, the third section, I focused on um, the body and um, so there was obviously parenthood, the, the mother and the child and the body coming from the body. And then the third section was really focusing on physical love and um, sexuality. And so I wanted to read this poem, Amor Fati. For those of you who are writing, it's a great exercise, is to write um, a love poem for your fate, regardless of what it is or how painful it is, right? Amor Fati. We wrestled in the basement, drunk, my head pressed hard into the coarse blue rug, windows dark. Upstairs, my mother stood at the stove. Soon, my body seemed to say, turning under you. It was 1986, the fire at DuPont Plaza the human immunodeficiency virus, the cha challenger falling in pieces over the Atlantic. You pinned me there, bent so close, I thought we might kiss. Your shirt stretched by my long pull, and I held on with both fists. Um, earlier today, we talked a bit about, um, um, Logan was introducing me, we talked a bit about ekphrastic poetry, poetry in response to visual art. And um, I had the opportunity to take part in this project in which um, it was through the Smithsonian and the University of Notre Dame. And what they did was they brought in all these Latinx um, writers to the Smithsonian at different times and to look at this exhibit of Latin American and Latinx um, visual art. And we were asked to um, write poems in response or fiction or prose. And so this was one of them. Um, I, I, so what I ended up doing is I flew to DC and then I stayed at this place and for four days I had to go kind of spend the day at the Smithsonian, had to, it was really amazing. <laughs> but I would wander around and I would just look for, wait for inspiration. I would go to the, eat some food and take a walk outside, come back up. I mean, it would take hours because you can't like make that up. You can't just, I mean, you can, you can start and with as a writing exercise and hopefully you find inspiration that way. But I was looking for something that, you know, just I could connect quickly and immediately to something important to me. And um, on one of those days I wrote 
in response to a painting called Platanal, um, which is a plantain orchard. And um, it was a painting by um, Mir Nabaez, a Puerto Rican um, painter. And it was a landscape very familiar to me, um, you know, having spent so much time in Puerto Rico visiting my, my mom's family. And um, the other thing I should say is that uh, my grandmother, uh, who's fiercely independent, was also um, an independent. Like, she wanted independence for the island of Puerto Rico. And so it was an interesting... Um, to come visit her from the U.S., right, um, the mainland, I guess, and um, and and hear her her position on um, on U.S. Puerto Rican relations. Um, yeah, so she passed away uh, before before this this um, poem was written. Revolution. Plantain trees gather at the edge of the orchard, clamor for light in the foreground. They seem to grow as one, as if they'd fill the field and the mountains behind them, leaves large and frayed. We stood there once, or someplace like it. So here we are again, it seems, years later, Branches leaning over the road, you in your long skirt, looking out as if to recall something you meant to do. My country, I hear you say still. But if that's dusk in the hills, you know what's coming to the field. You'll stand among them till there's nothing left to see. I'll wait beside you, though I don't know what we're waiting for. So, um, I might come back to this for one last poem, but I'm gonna move on to um, the next book um, that I wrote over the last few years. It's called Rara Avis, Strange or Rare Bird. My mom loves that phrase. She's a strange bird. Um, she has such funny, I mean, she says it with affection too. Um, often about like her grandkids. Um, so uh, yeah, and um, I wanted to write a different kind of poem. I didn't want to write those poems anymore. I was trying, I wanted to do something different. And so I was exploring different devices that might maybe um, articulate my obsessions in some different way. So um, one of the um, styles that I gravitated to is the discursive poem. Let me find it. So it's kind of the opposite of the spare poem. I need these glasses. This is new. I cannot even read. Um, actually, you know what? I better start with a different poem because I don't even know where that poem is. <laughs> so, okay. So the other thing, so I'll get to that and you'll hear it in a second. The other... Um, uh, Let me make sure I have this right. Okay. So the other thing that was happening at this time is my father is during the um, quarantine. I, grew, I live in LA and my family lives in DC and my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So there was this, um, you know, kind of processing this thing with, that my father was going through, this very serious surgery, removing organs. And, you know, during COVID where he had to be alone, it was... Yeah, it's kind of occupied a lot of um, my um, time was think, think, you know, thinking about these things. So this is the first poem that addresses, it's called Pancreas. Pancreas, from the Greek pan, meaning all or whole, and creus, meaning flesh. A gland, like a sponge, secreting fluids to regulate blood sugar, to break down Common ailments include inflammation, pancreatitis, and cancer, abdominal pain, weight loss, jaundice. It's possible to live without one, my father says on the phone, a dryness in his mouth, his, stung, his tongue sticking as he tells me what to expect, if he's lucky. And all day, everything, no matter how small, makes me think of it. 
hidden deep inside me, weeping. The bee crawling in blossoms scattered on the glass tabletop. The sound of a pitcher filling slowly with water. <clears throat> okay, let me see if I can, ah, found it. Okay, so here's the discursive poem that I was talking about earlier. So you can see, if you have the book, you can see like this is a much different looking poem. Longer line, no stanza break. Okay, excuse me. Que significa? I thought it'd be cooler here in late June, but all night I'm kicking off the sheets and pulling them back over my body in the stillness of my room until I remember suddenly those summers as a boy lying in the twin bed with you. That was before the highway, when one needed to drive up and down the mountains to get from one side of the island to the other, and Salinas, where the fishing nets hung to dry in branches along the shore, and we swam in a clearing among the mangroves or rocked in a hammock behind the house where my mother and your father were born, still seemed untouched by America. Sometimes at the bakery or with the woman who sold lottery tickets outside the restaurant or as the men drove us in the back of their trucks past the sugar cane fields, not understanding a word or turn of phrase, a joke someone made, I'd ask, ¿Qué significa? But it was already over or too hard to explain, you'd say. I grew homesick for English. One summer at the movies, you cried so hard it scared me, the screen lighting your wet face. One summer sprawled out on the floor in front of the TV in our bathing suits, we began to wrestle, laughing until our hands, then our mouths, moved across our bodies, driven by a force we let guide us. Then someone stopped, and we lay in the sunlit room, breathing hard. Someone must have gotten up and walked away. Someone must have made small talk until we could pretend it never happened. Quiero verte, you said on the phone, years later, both of us now with children of our own. And when I made it back one day to the island, I drove to your house knocking on the large door at the agreed upon time, but no one answered. The flamboyant trees were in bloom, their bright red blossoms scattered on the street, and it didn't take long to get back to my hotel, but I got lost. I'd never been to that part of the city, and so much had changed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So one of the things that I was trying to do in this poem is to move past just the story of my father's illness and to think about um, what it means to be a father or um, and and I myself was a father and what it might mean for my own children one day to watch my own um, aging and so this book kind of thinks tries to kind of hold both of those ideas in this one moment it's called in the book we are reading together. In the book we are reading together, the father dies before the first sentence. Namdi didn't want to look at his body in the casket. We pass it back and forth, taking turns, our heads casting shadows onto the page. Early on, the father returns from the dead as a shadow in the street. Is it really him? When they speak, we speak the way we imagine they'd sound, angry or sad. Sometimes I get to be the son and you're the dad. Sometimes you sound the letters out until a word reveals itself, new. You stare off as if you know how the book will come together. You look at my face as if you can see the sounds it makes. Sometimes you grow bored and want to stop. Sometimes you wonder if the father is gone for good. You yawn. 
It's getting late. We are coming to the last page, and I nod along. Soon, we'll see where the story has taken us. Sometimes you want a story to last forever, and sometimes you just want to know how it ends. Um, I'm gonna read, let me see, I'm doing for time. I think I'm doing great for time. <laughs> so, um, let's see. I think, uh, I'm, actually, I'm gonna read this one too. This one's, I think, I think it's funny. Maybe, um, maybe you won't think it's funny. Um, one of the reasons why I think it's funny is because I imagine the person it's about reading it <laughs> and just how angry she would get <laughs> if she heard it. Um, so, um, yeah. All right, kindness. <clears throat> It's one of the other discursive poems, another one of them. Kindness. He's kind because he wants people to like him, Mary's mother said. The first woman in Italy to earn a PhD in chemistry and whose family survived the war by hiding hens on the patio of their apartment. She knew I'd just come out of the closet at 24 and loathing myself saw any kindness, an act of great charity for which I should be eternally grateful. So maybe she was right, but her insight became another reason to hate myself. Mary and I taught in Tatabanya, Hungary that year where we earned $200 a month, but she'd lost her job and come to live with me in a small studio on the edge of town. That year, I met Mike and traveled as far as Mishkoltz, the other end of the country, to let him touch me, which was the first time I'd been touched by a man without feeling fear. That year, Mary lost so much weight that her thick hair started falling out. She'd run her fingers across her scalp and let the clumps fall to the floor. See? When we left, her hair grew back. She went to law school but said that she wanted to get married, have a family more than anything else. In our mid-30s, I went to her house where she lived with her husband, a military pilot, and two kids. She was a judge, and our friend Ivy, who we'd known as long as we'd known each other, had come too. I believe that, constitutionally, you have the right to marry a man, Mary told me, but I vote for whomever lets me keep as much of my money as possible. She went on to say, slicing a piece of cheese for her cracker, how difficult it'd be to get along without her au pair, whose two-year visa was ending and soon would have to go back to France if she didn't find an American husband, and would I consider it? Ivy looked embarrassed as I stumbled in confusion what I'd later recognize as anger to remind Mary that I was living with Joseph, a man I loved. We didn't talk again, Mary and I, until 2011 when she told me that Ivy had died and was surprised to hear that I suspected it was why she was calling after so much time. I explained how, a few months before, Ivy left a message to congratulate us about the adoption. I'm so happy, so, so happy for you both. And that she had cancer and hoped to beat it. But when she didn't answer my calls, I feared the worst. As far as Mary knew, Ivy hadn't told anyone else. She must have really liked you, Mary said to herself it seemed as much as to me. And I felt like I should say something kind in return and took a deep breath, considering how to begin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, here's one. Um, here's another ekphrastic poem. And I just... This one took me, I went in so many wrong, took so many wrong turns with this one. Um, it was like a double crown. <laughs> it ended up just being having three small sections. Um, uh, but uh, it, it all sparked because I was in a poetry reading and um, 
It was really great. Alison Bennis White, amazing poet at Riverside. And I looked in front of me and I realized that the silhouette of the guy in front of me looked like that jerk that dumped me <laughs> back in 2000. I still wasn't over yet, um, somehow. Um, and I just kind of like spent the whole reading kind of like thinking, that could be him. Like, <laughs> what if that's him? I mean, it wasn't him, but I just couldn't stop thinking like, I'm like in the room with him. Ah, anyway, <laughs> but the poem is called Forgiven. So you can kind of guess where it's heading. Um, okay. But isn't that strange when you think you see somebody? We've all done that, right? Yeah. It's like, I don't know, like anger and you want to give someone a piece of your mind, but maybe you also want to be like, I'm great without you. And, um, you know, who knows what else you want. All the feelings come in, right? And so there's like this hour of like, of it. So, so it's called uh, Forgiven and it's in three sections. When the shoulders of the man sitting in front of me are the width of your shoulders, the slouch, your slouch, I think this time to lean into the sting of your leaving, the way you leaned over a sink, the smell of shaving cream, your own face in the mirror, a speck of blood spreading in white foam. We sat there for nearly an hour, me and not you, and the poet on stage who said, a snow globe shaken relives the same shatter. Years later, I can not want you and not want you to have left. I held your waist and we rocked slowly under our studio's one window, which glowed with the morning paper you taped there so neighbors couldn't see. News of storms hitting the coast that summer, news of war. One night you stormed off at dinner, shaking your head, your fists. You had your own ghosts. You, who'd held a spoon of ice cream, cold and sweet to my mouth, singing, open up softly. After Rembrandt's The Prodigal Son. Forgiveness was the moral of the story and the master's depiction, which has been said to bring those who come upon it to tears. One man kneeling, his shorn head pressed into the other's robes. In the painting, the young man's clothes are tattered. His shoe has fallen off, his bare foot exposed. The light spills on both men from an open door somewhere beyond our view, and through which the one who has only now, after so many years, come through. Okay. So, all right, let's try this one. The good guy. We stood on the back porch in the late afternoon, crying hard but quiet so the kids wouldn't hear, and looked at each other. After, tired, we fell asleep on the couch, which we hadn't done in years. When we moved into this house, we found a garden, and that first summer I picked tomatoes, squash, my hands passing over what needed more time, what had fallen to the ground, rotting or half eaten. When the season ended, we let the grass spread over the dirt and whatever else was buried there. I woke up in the early evening to a sadness, like something I could point to, a painting you hung on the wall, a silver bowl you filled with coins from countries you might never see again. I could hear the boys playing in the next room. Now I get to be the bad guy. 
until one stopped the game to say, I'm hungry. Me too, the other said. And you got up slowly and made your way to the kitchen. So, okay. So I'm gonna read a few new poems. They're a little different. And I'm in, so I'll read, I think, I'll read, I'll read three. And then um, one last one from the book. It's a short one, okay? And then you're done. So you can start counting. One, two, three. And I promise no surprises. I went, I went to this reading once, and the guy had read for like an hour. And he's like, one more poem. And then it was like in 17 sections. I was like, oh my god. Really, truly, he did that. And I was like, you know, counting them up. And they weren't short poems either. Um, but I'm going to read these quickly, so we'll be done in no time at all. Um, the first one is called Ars Poetica, which, as you know, is a poem that's in response to poetry. Um, and and um, so, uh, and I've been gravitating toward more surreal images. I'm just trying to like reach out and figure out what's the next book going to be, what's it going to look like. And I've written a lot of clunkers, real terrible poems. And then a few of them, I feel like, oh my God, there might be something here. I think I want to move in this direction. And one thing that I'm leaning on right now is the wild imagination that my mother's family had. My grandmother told stories. My grandmother, someone said, magic is real tonight. My grandmother absolutely believed in magic without any sh you know, f fear. Or sh like, you know, if I called her, sh she's like, oh, I'm, I was calling you with my mind. You know, like, because <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about you. I'd be like, okay. And I grew up just being like, okay, whatever. Like, that's what my, my dad was like, not like that. <laughs> my dad was like really straight-laced engineer, you know. You know, and but my my mom's family was like that, and they still talk that way, you know. And um, so I thought, let me lean into some of these stories that I heard, um, and this kind of let my imagination treat the, um, these things as real. Why not? They were real for me at for a time. So ours poetica. When the car ran into the boy, he turned into a goat with two heads and fled into the hills so we could not wander far. My brother pointed to the bushes stirring. There, he said, do you see it? We sipped Pepsi from small paper cups and napped on the floor until the windows dimmed. Guests came for dinner, silver, fine china, a cup of tea, a slice of cake. Our neighbor sang Strauss, her hands came down on the piano keys as if she meant to hurt them. Her voice became the room, a spoon trembling on the edge of a saucer. Everyone remained composed. I could feel myself cracking like a clay pot. When I broke, I held both hands over my mouth, but my voice came rushing out a great sob that sounded like laughter. I laughed so hard I couldn't breathe. Um, okay, this next one is um, a lot of these, like, so a lot of them, I'm just kind of drawing on Puerto Rico for inspiration. My mom says this phrase a lot, and I finally, I just had heard it so many times, you just think it's normal, and then you're like, where did that come from? And so the phrase is, saben más que las arañas, right? They know more than the spiders. And um, I had heard her say it so much, she likes to say it about her granddaughters. They know more than the spiders. They know more than the spiders, you know? And, um, and I finally was like, where does that come from? And she's like, I don't know. And she's like, it's a Puerto Rican thing. It's a Puerto Rican thing. I'm like, okay. And sure enough, I looked it up, and they're like, it's, like, it's a Puerto Rican thing. You know, it's like not something that, um, I, that I, I saw, it said that it was a, like, really a Puerto Rican thing. Anyway, so it's like they know so much, they're industrious or what have you. So I wanted to write something in response to that. So the, to the, the poem title is The Middle Ages. And of course, it's a play off the Middle Ages, the, the era, but also as, you know, a, a, a man in his 50s married to another man in his 50s. We're in our Middle Ages as well. So, um, so it's a play off of that. The Middle Ages... Sabe más que las arañas, a Puerto Rican expression. What do spiders know that we don't after 20 years? The hair on the back of your neck bristles beneath my fingertips. 
no one cares. Last spring, you knelt in the grass to plant flowers along the curb. Tonight, it's littered with trash. I want you to kiss me like that. So, okay. So the last poem of the new poems that I'm going to read is a weird looking poem. So it's like this. So like this is more what you're used to if you read my last book, which is that right. But um, I'm trying to play with thinking about the sentence. I mean, I think about the line a lot with the short line you can think about in jam men and interesting line breaks and you can do so much. Poem can be so dynamic when you think about all those things. But sometimes I like to just think about the sentence and stretching out across the page. And there's something about um, the kind of the monostitch, the one line stanza that encourages this leaping. And, um, and so what I'm playing here with is um, getting a complete thought and then moving on to the next thing. And I feel like by focusing on the sentence instead of lineation and enjambment, you can do a lot of that. Like it can, the, the moment can be contained and then you can just jump to the next and jump to the next. And so we will jump. It's called A History of Coming and Going. From the edge of my bed, you told a story of your sister crying. Your words brought the scene into focus, like I was there, belonged there, though it happened well before your father died or I was born. The shop, the doll, the coins ringing in his pocket, so clear in my mind, in the dark, I didn't hear you leave. After we say goodbye, your bags set in the taxi's trunk, I start to cry the way a child might. How many times have we stood in front of a landscape or a painting of one and said, look at that, just look at it. Almonds scattered on the ground, chickens roosting in their pens, a hammock strung like an empty net. And from trash heaps burned each week those black mounds of plastic bottles, tin cans, charred wood. The small pier, too, waves against the pylons, one after the other. You said, it's like we're all standing single file. And when my mother stepped through that door, everyone took a step forward. One after the other, Dominga and Carmen and Eladia and Nicolasa and Carolina Vasquez, born 1843 in Salinas, Puerto Rico. A fishing village founded in 1840 on the island's southern coast and for a brief time home to Julia de Burgos, 1914 to 1953. In El Mar y Tú, otros poemas, de Burgos wrote, it looks like the sea, the sky where I have lain to dream of you. Translation, mine. The mothers watched from their blankets as we splashed in the shallows. When we drifted too far, they called our names and we swam back to shore. So that is like, yes, thank you for listening to that. This is my first time ever reading this. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. So um, I, think, I think maybe it's been about 40 minutes, so it's probably a good time to... Or you can go back to that one I could read one more, like short one. Is, yeah, okay, I'll read one last one. Okay. I kind of want to end on, I want to end on this one because it's, um, because you guys read this, or some of you read this book. So um, I'm going to tell the story. I don't usually tell all the stories, but whatever. Um, so I, I went to, after Maryland, I went to Houston, University of Houston. And um, when I was there, um, I, I mean, it, I was fine, but I was assaulted outside of a, a gay club. And um, the police officer basically was like, if you don't get on my face, I'm gonna arrest you, even though I was bleeding and, you know. And so it was pretty traumatic. 
and then, or whatever, you know, like I was fine, but I wasn't fine. And then I went on with my life and, um, and years later I met Joseph, my now husband, and we lived in Nashville and it was like fine. Nashville was fine. You know, like there were little pockets where it felt safe. But you know, when he liked to go to Costco, which I hated, you know, I'd always be like, you know, people would kind of like push their carts around looking at us and Sometimes they would come, start coming toward me. I'd be like, don't do it, lady. Don't come talk to me. I don't, want, I don't know what you're going to say. But I, I was like kind of on edge a lot. And it was always with the, the children. You know, like when I was with the children, that's when I felt like we were most scrutinized. And then we moved to L.A. where, of course, there is homophobia and racism just like anywhere else. But um, we went on our first date. And um, we were like, wow, we're here. We live here. Like, how weird is that? And he reached over and he touched my hand and I flinched. And I realized that was the me who was scared for his well safety, physical safety. And I realized in that moment, it was okay. You know, like he can express this feeling and I'm gonna be okay. So the whole poem kind of just came from that little gesture. Just someone simply reaching over and touching my hand and no one in the restaurant cared. Obvious, you know, at all. But okay, so that's the kind of the backstory of this very short poem, which is shorter than the explanation. So, gesture. You stretched your hand across the table and said something I couldn't hear over the clatter of forks and plates, the restaurant's dumb chatter. And though the body, once thrown to the ground, bruised and bleeding for what it wanted, has a memory of its own, how policemen laughed later. The body also speaks its own language, your hand open before me and the world as if to say, I cannot save you, holds something like happiness in it. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with questions. If you guys are tired and like, get me out of here, fine. I understand. Late in the semester, we're wiped out. But I'm also thrilled. So, so generous. The most generous thing anyone can do is listen to your poems, honestly. It really is. So I, I really appreciate it. I, I feel like you were pretty generous sharing well, the poems, oh, with thanks, us, especially well, thank you. the new ones. Well, I, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. A couple of questions? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, is there a thing for you that you feel like keeps coming up for you? For sure. Yeah. So um, I think, um, you know, we have our obsessions. We just do, right? And so, um, uh, yeah, and I think that's what, I think the trick of keeping remaining an artist is finding new ways of approaching the, um, the material. Like, just like a painter, right? Like, the, you know, like maybe it's the blue period. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, you, know you, you, like you have to find new ways of getting in. And that's why I was talking about this before. I, after I finished um, this last book, Ra Ra Avis, the one that I read from the second, second one, I didn't write for like a year and a half because I knew everything I wrote would just sound like the last book I wrote. I don't want to do that again. I already did that. And I think that I feel that way after every book. And but I do gravitate toward themes of exile, solitude, um, longing. Um, yeah. So yeah. 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 How do you get yourself from that? Like trying to say that I'm not gonna write about that. How do you get yourself focused to something like that? I well either you know, you um like I like an acrostic poem. You can write like a so I'll instead of drawing from my own life then I'll, um, you know, try and find something outside of myself that will let me, you know, do that. Try and hit different tonal marks too, like, like I mean, the, the Middle Ages is supposed to be kind of funny, like we're old men, we're like we, got, we can still like you, you know, come on. <laughs> we don't have to be, you know, get, you know, anyway. So, but like, so you can, you, I think you can be funny and f approach it from that angle. You can look at art, you can, like I have poems that haven't quite made it yet that are uh, in response to song, to music, 
um, to history, to architecture. So like, I'm just trying to like, uh, yeah, but somehow I kind of keep projecting onto the, you know, your, it's what's in your heart, you know, and so, um, yeah, so right now, and, and right now, you know, my life is pretty full with children and making sure they're, like we were saying, that they're, that they're brushing their teeth and all, the, uh, all those little things. So a lot of my, my mind is occupied by things like that. And so when I sit down to write, you know, I might be like, oh, it's a beautiful sunset. But I'm also thinking, like, did my kid floss, you know, or whatever. So, like, it's kind of like, or did he eat a vegetable today or in this week? So, like, those things are, like, in there. So, like, they kind of sneak into the poem. Or, like, if my father's, you know, ill. He's fine. He's okay now. But, you know, that year I could be writing about bees, like, crawling into f blossoms that had fallen onto the glass table. But I'm thinking about my father illness. So it just kind of creeps in there. I don't know if I need to apologize for, I mean, not, not that you're at, like saying I should, I kind of think as I just, if I just keep finding new devices, then the poems will be new. So, um, so for, so like I said, I'm kind of moving toward the surreal right now and I'm really finding that fun and making jokes and kind of maybe having a sense of humor about it. And maybe that's, that will be helpful too. But I, 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 I uh, I feel like I can take my time and figure that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I'm obsessed for, with the same things all my life, I think. But yeah, but yeah, you know, like, I mean, I do, I think I just like the whole, my whole life, I'm like, yeah. I mean, because you think about it, I was a gay man in the closet till I was 24. So even though, and I was in a Puerto Rican family in a largely white neighborhood. And so no other Puerto Ricans around me until I went to Puerto Rico. And then there was like, you're not Puerto Rican, you're American. You know, like, so I, so I felt a lot like, uh, where do I belong? Like not in my own family and not in the neighborhood and not with that family. So it just kind of is like a core impression made upon me. And so it's not like I think, oh, I'm going to write about this theme. I don't think that way. I'm, I'm, I get tired of hearing about my, myself talk about these things. So honestly, so like, but it's just part of my, my nature. And I think that when we're writing, we often project onto whatever we're talking about. Like we're looking at the world through a lens. Right, and we're not looking at it objectively. We can't. So whatever you describe will have something of you on it, right? So that's what makes. I mean, I'm not a visual artist, but that's what makes still lives life's interesting, right? If we have a bowl of fruit. We could all paint it, but each one will be different because we project onto that bowl of fruit something of us, right? No matter what, and that's what happens in the poem. And I could be writing about a painting, or I could be writing about a song, but these things just kind of sneak in. And um, yeah, so, but then afterwards, when I'm looking at the book, I start to think, okay, well, how do these poems speak to one another? And then I just start to pair things or move them apart from each other. I don't, maybe I don't want people to read 10 poems that address the same subject so explicitly. You know? So that's where the theme, issues of themes come in, or I'll, or I'll bury one a bit more. Like, I don't need to bring that to the surface, bury it. Like the image is saying everything. Um, you know, I don't need to, like the pancreas, like I mentioned this before, but the two images of a pitcher filling with water and a bee crawling into a dead blossom, to me, like it felt cancerous. And also like the idea of like, uh, like, I could, like when my father was talking, he had to, like, I could tell his mouth was dry. Like, so I, those images said everything. I didn't need to kind of ex explicitly say, what will I do if you're gone? Well, I can't, you know, I can't reach you. I didn't have to say all that. You know, it's just kind of more um, subtly suggested. Yeah. So the themes is more of an afterthought. I don't think consciously. I'm going to write about these themes. It's just like, yeah, who are, yeah. Yeah, of course. Great question. Can you talk a little bit more about this idea of the book? And when you started, I was very impressed with you. Here's the book I finished. Here's the next book. Yeah. Here's the next book. And here's this. Yeah, here are the new so things. So how soon do you know it's a book? And I, how do you decide what goes in the book, what doesn't? Do you write extra and then decide? Or? So um, I, I try not to like think too, much, too far ahead. 
I think just you gotta stay in the moment of uh, you're a writer. You know, like write the poem, then write the next poem. Then I mean, you know, when you can and have pleasure, like it's a, what, it's a joy to like to think about these things and kind of examine them and like play with language and devices. That's so much fun. So I try kind of stay in that world and not think too much of readers or publishing or anything like that. And then when I have a substantial number of poems, I'm like, okay, I better look and see what I've got here. Because right now, like, I have a, a, fi a file of, like, 15 pages, but I know a lot of them are not good. But I might, they might become good. I don't know. But, so, but I'll let that file grow to maybe 50, right, pages. And then I'll start to look. And I'm like, oh, wait. Now I know how to revise this because I wrote this other poem. And that's going to tell me how to revise this poem. And that, and so, so they start to inform each other. They start to speak to one another. Or I use that image here. I don't need it here. Cut that. So like, they start to, to speak to one another and tell me how they need to be revised. And they also kind of, I start to see the relationships among them and seeing, oh, if I put this one next to this one, it makes this one, you know, resonate more. Um, and so then I start to shape and to kind of um, start to see the book. And then once I do that, I read through it. And the subconscious mind is just so powerful that it will figure out what is missing. It just, our brains are amazing. And if I sit there and think, I need to write a poem, blah, 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 it's going to be a terrible poem. But if I just kind of try and hold the manuscript in my head and just write, then my subconscious mind will draw things together. And all of a sudden, it's like that poem about my dad and my poem about my son like, are all like, are speaking to this poem about, about, which it could speak to both of them. Do you see what I mean? So all of a sudden, it's kind of like, you know, multiple connections are being made throughout. That's what you want in a book where it's not a story. It's not like, you know, then this happened, then this happened. It's the third poem is resonating with the first. It's going to resonate with the last. And there's a thematic progression. And there are like images that might recur in different ways. And so, yeah, and that's all, that's a whole other pleasure as well. Um, but yeah, so, that, so I'd say like after about a substantial number of poems, I start to look and then I kind of put it aside again and then just keep writing. And then I come back and I'm like, oh, look at that. Wow. <laughs> it goes right there. It's perfect, you know. So, so everyone who is writing a poetry thesis project, remember all Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is the hard, putting it together a thesis is so challenging. But it's also, it's just like when it clicks, it clicks. You know, and you gotta try, you gotta make all those bad moves. You gotta go in the wrong direction a lot of times. And then you'll know it's the wrong direction. Like, ah, it's not working. No, that's not working. Let me try it this way. And then something happens. You write that one poem, you're like, oh. So like with my first book, I had, I had written at least 50 pu publishable poems or published poems, but that didn't make a good book. And it was, um, and then I went to Puerto Rico and I was living in Vieques and I um, was taking the ferry back and forth. And I took the ferry once and I was reading on this brochure about how the ferry crashed one year. And I wrote a poem about the, about the ferry going from the mainland to Vieques and not making it. And I just thought, that's the metaphor for my book. You know, like this journey from one place to the other. And I thought every poem is, is, a, is um, somewhere on that journey from Vieques to Culebra, right, where it did land. So, and I thought, okay, so what I started doing is thinking of the, the earlier poems, like regardless of theme, I don't care. It could be about my mother, it could be about sex, it could be this, it could be whatever. Those go here. And then the middle of the journey is here. And then the end of the journey arriving is here. They didn't have to be happy poems. In fact, they were sometimes like, that sucks, but that's just it. You know, like that. So, but that, and so all of a sudden, that poem was the key for me to understand the whole book, that, that it became the, the, the conceit for the book, the metaphor for the book. And I was like, oh, I mean, I don't say that, but in my head, it just all clicked. And then I just put it in there, sent it to the press. They took it. I was like, great. But I didn't, until I wrote that poem, I had no, I, I tried lots of ways that didn't work. And then that one worked. So you just got to keep trying. And every book was different. Every book was, I found it. It's like, it's like 
finding your way to Narnia. You know what I mean? Like you go through the wardrobe and you get there and you're in this magical place, but then the wardrobe doesn't let you back in. You know what I mean? You gotta find the next way in. Maybe it's a painting, maybe, you know, it's a sub, or like the metro, you don't know. So, but you just gotta keep open to it and then it will reveal itself to you, that door. In my, um, in my MFA program that I teach in at San Diego State, I think it's the most important class I teach is the forms class. And a lot of students are like, I don't want to write in form. I get it. I get it. But I don't think it's important because I need everybody to be sonneteers. You know? <laughs> it's not the point. The point is that those forms force you to think about all the things you should be thinking about when you're writing free verse. You should be thinking about syntax. You should be thinking about diction. You should be thinking about line breaks, line length, rhythm, you know, paradox, all those things. And these forms make you do it. It brings to the forefront of your mind. Um, my professor, one of my professors said, um, think of the different devices as the keys of a piano. And if you're only playing a few keys, if you're only using a few devices, how, many, how big is your repertoire going to be? How many songs can you play? You need to practice the other keys, know what they sound like, become familiar with them. You need to study the aphorism. You need to study the haiku. You need to, the deep image. All, and so these forms, whether it's like a form based in meter or a form based in repetition and refrain, you know, whatever it is, you know, I think it's important to do that so that when you go write whatever it is you want to write, it might not be a sonnet, but you will know how to turn your poem. You know, and, and you don't know, it just, what ends up happening is those devices become part of your intuition. It's not like, you know, I don't say I'm going to write a sonnet. It's I start to write, and I'm like, oh, this feels like unrequited love. Oh, this feels like it's about 14 lines. Oh, and then it might end up being 15 or 12. It doesn't matter. But the point is I understand kind of like I have a kind of sense of the, what the poem is, how, what it's speaking to in the tradition. So I think... It's an excellent way to, um, to hone your skills and also maybe write great poems. And to think about, this is the other thing, sorry I'm giving this lecture, but I've been saying this a lot. <laughs> the other thing is this, is that form, every poem has a form. Every poem has a form. And there sh must be a relationship between the form and the content. It might not, it might be intuitive, but you know, it's not just line breaks willy-nilly. It's like, there, you know, maybe it's a stick it because it's a long, winding story that's complicated, whatever. And maybe it's in couplets because you're leaping and leaping and leaping and you want to give white space for the reader. It's like, but there is a relationship between those two things. And in fact, it's not just a relationship. I would say they're the same thing. That, that how you say something changes what you say. If you have a long line, changes, you know, everything. So I think it's, it's essential to, 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 to think about, about these issues, and that's one way, tried way, to kind of learn a lot of different devices, um, and then you can apply them to whatever you write. So I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, generous. Thank you very much. That was great.